Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description and click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a fundamental technique in risk management that is how to backtest expected shortfall or conditional VAR in other terms. It's widely known that conventional VAR modeling suffers many limitations and expected shortfall has a roughly taken its place as a go-to market risk evaluation procedure. However, it's not entirely clear how one might backtest expected shortfall conditional VAR given that it's not clear how to measure the severity of its violations. For VAR, it's simple. If your loss exceeds one mandated by your VAR model, you just record it as a violation, and then you use a standard coverage test or a Coupiet's likelihood ratio test to figure out how different is that from the expected proportion of violations. However, for expected shortfall, as you are figuring out the average loss on the tail, and not just a loss at a particular threshold in terms of probability, this logic breaks down. However, a generalized breach indicator can be proposed to substitute the simple violation count for expected shortfall compared to standard VR, and the testing can be surprisingly neat and simple. So today, we'll apply the generalized breach indicator to backtest expected shortfall or conditional VR based on five years worth of BlackRock data. Again, a very prominent uh, investment fund which uh, likely is involved with measuring and assessing its market risk. First of all, we calculate daily returns. Again, it's quite instrumental to estimate VAR on five years worth of daily frequency. That's what a Basel mandates after all. So we can calculate those day to day. Then we can keep track of what our sample size is by just counting how many returns we've got. Then we can specify our content interval. Let's start with 5% and then we can change it and see how results are affected later. Then we can calculate our average daily return, which uh, is easiest to retrieve using product one plus an area of returns raised into the power of one over the sample size that we've just calculated minus one resulting in an average BlackRock return of five basis points per day, which is pretty typical for stock markets. For the volatility, again, we're concerned with daily volatility as it's daily VR and daily expected shortfall that we care about. We just use sample standard deviation and apply it to returns and get a volatility of 1.95% daily. For the ZStat, we can use a standard normal inverse distribution, norm as INV, and plug in our constant interval alpha which would result in a very famous Z stat of minus 1.64 for the 5% confidence interval. And VAR is very simple to estimate from there. We just add Z stat times volatility to our mean, our expected return, and get a VAR of 3.15%. For the expected shortfall, the simplest and most straightforward technique here would be to use the inverse Mills ratio. We've got a separate video on using the inverse Mills ratio to calculate the conditional expectation for the normal distribution and how it applies to conditional VR or expected shortfall. Check this out here if you're primarily interested in that. However, here we simply apply the inverse Mills ratio for conditional VR for evaluation purposes. So from the return, we subtract our volatility times the ratio between the standard normal distribution of our Z-stat, which is the probability density function, so zero, and we divide it by the cumulative distribution function in applying our Z-stat uh, inside this, the argument. And that allows us to generate our expected shortfall as a closed form solution, which is why the inverse Mills ratio can be preferred if you are doing parametric normal VR and CVR. Here we see that the expected loss at the tail is considerably higher than the loss at the threshold, which VR is, and is equal to minus 3.97%. And now, if we were concerned with VR, we could simply calculate the violations. However, for the generalized breach indicator, we are also interested in how severe those violations are. However, knowing whether there is a violation is instrumental for calculating the generalized breach. So we start from there. If our return is lower than our VR, 
and we lock the VAR as is the same for the whole sample, that is a violation, so we input 1 and 0 otherwise. And we enforce it throughout the sample, and we can see that there are 52 violations of our 50 of our 5% VAR. Now, in terms of the severity, we might also want to know uh, what is the cumulative distribution function value for this particular return, given the mean and volatility we estimated. So we can input the normal distribution function for our return, then we input our mean, which is our daily expected return, locking it, as it stays the same for the entire distribution. Then we input our standard deviation, which is the volatility, again staying the same for the entire distribution. And as we're interested in the cumulative distribution function, capital Phi here, we would input 1. And that would allow us to calculate the severity. This is the crucial term that differentiates simple violation count or breach count for VAR backtesting from the generalized breach indicator in the uh, expected shortfall or conditional VAR testing. If there is a violation, we need to record how severe it is, and this is the term that uh, does the job for us. Because if our return is very low and our um, cumulative distribution function of value is close to zero, the severity will be close to one, which means that it's a very severe violation of our expected shortfall. However, if this particular ratio is quite close to the VAR threshold, so the violation has not been that severe, this ratio, uh, cumulative distribution function divided by alpha, will be close to one itself, and so this difference will be close to zero, signifying that this violation is not so severe. So for the severity, we can calculate the difference between one and the probability divided by our alpha, and we can lock alpha here as it again stays the same, and then we can multiply it by 0 or 1, depending on whether the violation occurred. And that is what's calculated in the one of the neighboring columns. And that allows us to calculate the severity throughout. And uh, we can uh, quickly scroll and see uh, what those terms look like. For example, over here, uh, when the return is minus 4.26%, this constitutes to the cumulative distribution function value of 1.34%. And that's quite severe because this um, probability is quite a bit closer to zero than it is to 5%, which is our confidence interval, meaning that this um, severity index is closer to one than it is to zero. It's quite a severe violation. Similarly here, as this return is even lower, as this loss is even higher, the severity indicator is marginally higher here. And if we have a look further, we can see that this particular violation, minus 3.43%, as loss is not so severe, this uh, probability is quite a bit closer to 5% than the previously encountered ones, this severity indicator is quite low at 0.26. And this is what can be used to conceptualize not only the effect of uh, a VR violation, but also the severity of its violation, which is fundamental for the concept of expected shortfall. Now for the generalized breach indicator, we can sum up all of our severity indicators and get 33.8. However, what are the expected um, values of the generalized breach indicator given our data, and most importantly for statistical testing purposes, how volatile would you expect them to be? And for that, a quite simple deviation can be uh, introduced, basing it on the simple fact that uh, this particular severity indicator is uh, entirely focused on the probability. So, if there is a violation occurring, and, uh, well, the number of expected violations is still alpha, the confidence interval, times the sample size n, this is quite straightforward and that's directly following from the uh, standard coverage test for the normal VAR. This one half reflects the fact that the expected value of the severity indicator given a violation occurring is exactly a half because you are as likely to roll something very close to 0% in terms of this probability and um, exactly as equally likely to roll something that's very close to 5% in our case, or to any other confidence interval if you choose another one. So our mean is a half times alpha times the sample size n, which returns an expected value for the generalized breach indicator at 31.43, meaning that we have breached our uh, VAR uh, quite a bit more often and quite a bit more intensively than we were expected to. But how um, substantial, how statistically significant this deviation is? Well, for that, 
the derivation uses, again, the logic of binomial distribution, and it can be uh, proven that the uh, variance of our generalized bridge indicator is just a function of alpha, meaning that it is not dependent on the sample size. So the higher the sample size, the easiest it is to de detect breaches, which is very uh, common of a finding in um, statistical testing of proportions. So for the uh, standard uh, deviation, we can take the square root of our confidence um, level alpha times four minus three alpha divided by 12. And that gives us a standard deviation of 0 0.13. That allows us to calculate a Z-stat for our significance testing of the generalized breach indicator. Again, it's fair to say that this distribution is only asymptotically normal, and there are more precise procedures for the exact distribution if the sample size is small. However, our sample size is quite large, and it will always be if you're doing five years worth of data, given that's mandated by uh, Basel generally. So 1,257 observations can be considered a, a large enough sample so that those asymptotics work. So for the Z-stat, we can calculate the difference between the generalized breach indicator and its expected value, and divide it by the standard deviation that we've just calculated, resulting in a very high Z-stat of 18.78, which then would translate into a p-value retrieved from a two-tailed um, Z-test, inputting the absolute value of the Z-stat and one for cumulative. And we can see that such a deviation from the generalized breach indicator would be extremely unlikely. That would be also the case if we try and change our confidence levels. For example, if we go to 2.5%, which is a very common confidence level for expected shortfall modeling purposes uh, precisely, we can see that the difference between the generalized breach indicator value and its expected value is even higher, and that pronounces um, itself in even a higher Z-stat, which translates into this sort of breach uh, being very unlikely if the model is um, applicable, which means that the normal distribution does not um, solve our risk management um, issues, even if we uh, go from conventional VR into expected shortfall or conditional VR modeling. If we go further to 1%, the issue becomes even more pronounced. And again, that's a very a common sign that you see with fat tail distribution, which BlackRock returns surely are, when you're using the normal distribution and you're going for smaller confidence intervals, your uh, model breaks down very often. But if we go to a confidence interval of 10%, we'll see that the result is reverse. Our generalized breach indicator is way too small compared to the mean, meaning that at 10% confidence interval, the normal distribution overestimates the frequency and intensity of our losses, which is, again, a very common finding with heavy tail distributions, which are also thin peaked, and the 10% tail uh, is exaggerated by the normal distribution, although it is underestimated for the uh, lower quantiles, lower values of alpha, such as 1%, 2.5%, and even 5% that we started with. And that's all there is for evaluating and backtesting expected shortfall or conditional VAR using the generalized breach indicator. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any first suggestions for videos that you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider support us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.